Hey, good day, everybody. Steve Prisbrowski here. Welcome to episode two of How to Excel at Fire Department Promotional Exams. We're going to discuss more about the top 10 reasons people don't pass or sky score high enough on their promotional exam to get the badge or even to be considered to get the badge. So this is part two. In the first episode, we discussed the first five reasons I believe that people don't score as well as they should or they don't pass. So let's continue with that. As a reminder, my website, code3firetraining.com, has lots of great free information, promotional preparation, officer development, leadership, training, regardless of the rank that you're in or you aspire to in the fire service. My website has tons of great stuff on there, articles I've written, um, resources I think are valuable for you or anybody else. So please take the time to check the stuff out. It's been very helpful to a lot of people around the country. Also, uh, these webinars are based upon one of the books I've had published. I've had some entry-level books published that are available off my website if you know of anyone that wants to become a firefighter. This is uh, one that I've uh, published a few years ago, How to Excel at Fire Department Promotional Exams, pretty much an A to Z book on helping you be the best promotional candidate you can be. I've also got a major publisher that's going to be publishing my fourth book, 101 Tips, to assist you on your next promotional exam, hopefully coming out later this year, 2020 or early 2021. More details, obviously, when I have them. But for right now, very excited to at least be able to have this book to help you be the best promotional candidate you can be, and more importantly, the best whatever rank you aspire to be. All right, in the previous episode, number one, we discussed the first five of 10 reasons fire service professionals do not pass or do not score as high as they want to on a promotional exam. So let's get into six through 10. So number 10, excuse me, number 10. Number six, nervousness gets the best of them. Here's the thing, when you, a fire department, when they hold a promotional examination, the goal is not to fail everybody. The goal is to not pass everybody necessarily unless they're ready to be passed, but the goal is not to fail each other either. So our hope is that everybody passes. I mean, again, in a perfect world, it'd be nice to have a good problem of everyone passing and then we got to pick the best of the best, but it doesn't usually work that way. We also understand that you're gonna be nervous. Hey, everyone is nervous, especially usually on test day. I mean, nervousness is not a bad thing, but the problem is when it gets the best of you, meaning you can't communicate, you can't spit anything out, you brain fart or you just vapor lock, the board can't help you at all. I mean, at that point, I mean, it's embarrassing and I feel for those candidates because I've been a candidate sometimes in the past where I just brain fart, I can't remember, I get it, we've been there, but we try our best and most raiders will try to be like, hey, take a deep breath, take a glass of water, maybe, you know, but you still got to perform, but you can't let your nervousness get the best, best of you. I truly think what can help nerves is obviously a lot of preparation. So if you prepared for the position as best you could, I'm hoping that takes care of a lot of the nerves. I mean, I, I mean, it's everybody's different. We all handle stress differently here, but you, but you got to get it under control. Number seven, lack of detail or lack of attention to detail, both, both are appropriate, or unable to justify or defend actions or non-actions. I'll give an example. In the first episode, I talked about a scenario where you may get a situation for a fire ground simulation where they say, okay, you're the captain on engine one. You pull up to a house on fire. There appears to be a bedroom fire. Where would you take the hose line in and why? And a lot of candidates are like, oh my God, do they want me to take it in the front door? Do they want me to take it in the back door? Do they want me to take it through the garage? Do they want me to hit it hard from the yard? Do they want me to go through a window? Well, first of all, the board, the Raiders don't necessarily want you to do any specific thing. They want you to make a decision, number one, stick to that decision unless there's damn good reason to change that decision and follow through. And more importantly, justify why you did what you did or did not do. So whether you take the hose line through the front door, or the back door, or go through the burn to the unburned, or the unburned to the burn, or this to that. Now, they may not agree with your, your choice, but the key is don't stress over what you think they want to hear. As long as it's safe, as long as it's ethical, as long as it's reasonable, that's usually fine. And I may not agree with your justification, but as long as you can sell me on it as a raider, then I'm like, okay, you know, I, I don't know if I would do that, but you know what? They seem to know what they're doing. And you know what? They seem competent enough to make it happen. So let's run with it. But unfortunately, a lot of candidates, well, I'll take it through the front door. Uh, I'll take the hose line through the front door to attack the fire. And then for some reason, maybe they don't justify it. Maybe a board member will go, well, why didn't you take it through the garage door? Or why didn't you take it through the back door? Or why did you even make an offensive attack? And then what happens to a lot of candidates is like number six, nervousness gets the best of them. Now they start freaking out. Um, well, I don't know, maybe I should have 
now they start being indecisive and it's like, well, maybe I should have done that. Or are they seeing something I don't know? Or do they know something I don't know? And then they start versus they should have just said no. And I pull up the structure based on what I see right here. I'm obviously going to do my 360 hot lap to make sure I'm seeing fully what's going on on Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta side. But if this is still what I'm seeing right here, I think the best and safest, quickest and best course of action is to take the pre-connected hose line through the front door, make a hard left, contain the fire to that room of origin and hopefully keep it there while also getting our primary search and blah, blah. So much of it comes down to your confidence, not arrogance, not cockiness, but confidence and just ability to manage the incident. That's all we're asking. It's not rocket science, but you got to, you got to justify it. That's what counts the most is your justification. And don't be defensive. If they question, why did you not do burn to the unburned side? Or why did you do one? You know, why did you take, why did you attack the fire from the burn to the unburned or vice versa? Or why did you use a fog nozzle versus a smooth bore nozzle? <gasps> now they're not going to usually get the weeds of smooth bores, fog nozzles, and you shouldn't either, because especially as a company officer, you've got to be a little more big picture than that. But anyway, that's my point is don't, don't worry about it. There's many right ways to do it. Just justify it. Also, if you're doing anything unsafe or unorthodox, that could get you in trouble too. Like usually a good example is maybe not establishing a rapid intervention team or crew, whatever you call it in your jurisdiction, or maybe violating two out when you really shouldn't be. Now there's a time and a place to violate two in, two out by all means. That's what the law is there for is there's parameters in there that when you have a reasonable belief that there's a life to be saved, then you can violate two in, two out. But you got to understand that and know that inside now before you even get to the assessment center because an officer should. But there's also a time and a place where maybe you have to follow two in and two out because the requirements aren't met for you to violate it. But again, unsafe, unorthodox practices, that's what usually gets candidates in trouble. So, and like I mentioned earlier, not having a rapid intervention crew, that's a common thing sometimes is that here you have a big incident. They give you, I mean, when I say big, as a captain, you're not going to get a 20 alarm fire. Most captains were going to give a good first alarm or maybe second alarm incident too. If you're going for a battalion chief's test, maybe it's second alarm, third at the most. I mean, there's no reason to, there's no reason to give you the plane into the high rise building. I mean, in all honesty, a good working structure fire in a residential structure can be challenging enough for just a captain or, or even a new BC. If especially you throw in some curveballs, like maybe there's someone to be rescued, firefighter down situation, or maybe a potential exposure, exposure situation, the structure of the rear starts burning or to the side or whatever. But, but anyway, I digress. So unsafe, unorthodox practices. I've seen a lot of candidates sometimes where they do get thrown the curveball you know, halfway through, because a simulation exercise, which we'll talk about at some point in the future, if you do have a tactical scenario or a tactical simulation, a fire ground simulation, emergency scene simulation, whatever it is, where you have to manage an emergency event as the first in officer or first in chief officer, it's not all going to be easy. There's a chance they're going to throw a curveball at you. I mean, you may have five minutes or 10 minutes in the room watching a video or watching a bunch of series of pictures. Don't think five minutes in, all right, I got this thing. I got water on the fire. It looks like I got it surrounded. Excuse me, I got two alarms of equipment. We're good to go here. Well, just when you think it's going good, you're going to get a curveball more than likely. Hey, I see, for instance, Commander, I see, uh, you know, Jones, I see from dispatch, yes, we have a report of a firefighter down or mayday, mayday, mayday. And then you're like, oh, shit. There's nothing worse than hearing a mayday call number one or firefighter down missing trap, which is a mayday call. There's nothing worse than hearing that than you looking over as the incident commander to your staging area and seeing, ah, oh, shit, number one, I got no resources in staging or very few, and I have not established a rapid intervention crew, team, company, whatever you call it. Now, I'll be upfront that rapid intervention is not rapid. If you look at the studies, Steve Christ from the Phoenix Fire Department, retired assistant chief, Don Abbott, retired Phoenix Fire, um, Don does a lot of the, um, Steve Christ's thing was rapid intervention is not rapid. Don Abbott does Project Mayday right now. It's a very complex issue. If you're expecting those three or four people in your RIT team to save the day, they usually won't. There's a lot of better things and we could talk for hours on that. But the point is, you got to at least have a RIT, 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 whatever you call it, team in place. Again, you're going to probably have to bolster them if you do have a firefighter down, missing or trap, and you're going to have to call extra alarms to support them, but at least have something. But when you're in a promotional exam and they say, hey, we've got a firefighter down, and then you're looking at your 
tactical worksheet or whatever you're using to track your resources, hopefully it's a piece of paper, not just your head. And then you have that oh crap moment where you're like, I, and I've seen that where candidates never establish rapid intervention. And then when they have the missing firefighter, it's like, oh shit, I didn't establish rapid intervention. That's usually a failure point at that point. So you don't want to be a checklist incident commander like I talked about in the first episode, but you got to have some methodical, organized way to manage personnel, manage your resources, track them, and not let major things get forgotten. I mean, if your personnel truly are your most important asset and resource, which they better be, then you know what? Support them. And I know rapid intervention, like I said, is not always rapid. And a lot of times rapid intervention does not save every firefighter. I mean, many firefighters are more likely to be saved by crews that are actually working in the area studies have shown or getting themselves out of the trouble, out of trouble or not putting themselves in that position. So be safe. Don't do unorthodox stuff. Don't do it. Just leave it at that. All right, a couple more items. The inability to be the designated adult. Now, I know that sounds maybe harsh to some people, but when you go to a promotional examination, now every department does a promotional exam differently. Some just do a written test. Some just do an oral interview. Some may have a full assessment center that has multiple different stations, oral interview, emergency simulation, personnel scenario, subordinate counseling scenario, writing exercise, end basket, all these little things that make up typically an assessment center. Well, think about this. Fire ground makes up 5% or less of what you do as an officer or what a firefighter does. Think about the other 95% of your time, if not 100% of your time, it's dealing with people, dealing with your crew. And as a good company officer, when you go from buddy to boss, the buddy to boss is one of the biggest transitions in the fire service and the world in general. It's just, I mean, buddy to boss can be used in any line of work. You're going from worker B to now first level supervisor. And that's a drastic jump because one minute you're the buddy and the next minute you got the toilet plungers on and you got the badge on and you're like, oh, wait, I'm the boss now. Yeah, you are the boss. And that's what you're getting promoted for. The fire chief is not promoting you to captain or lieutenant to be the nice person. I mean, be nice, please. God rest his soul, Chief Alan Bernicini. Be nice. Don't be an asshole. Don't be a jerk. But you've also got to be the designated adult when necessary. So don't be surprised in your promotional assessments there that they give you a scenario of you've got maybe a marginal employee or you have an employee that's crossing the line, doing something illegal, inappropriate, unethical, violating policy. Be the designated adult. Someone's got to be there. That's why we pay you to be an officer. Or if you're a volunteer, why you got appointed to be the officer. Not to have fun anymore. I mean, have fun. Don't get me wrong. But you're the one sort of like a parent that has to say, nope, stop it, knock it off. So I remember years back, we were having an orientation session for our captain's test. And one of the firefighters raised his hand. He's like, chief, to our assistant chief. He's like, so when we have the personnel scenario, basically we do like a role play scenario of you're the captain. And then you've got basically a pain in the butt firefighter, which you're going to have. I remember this one firefighter that wanted to be a captain. He goes, so chief, do you want us to be the hard ass and take the tough line? Or do you want us to be the nice guy? And I remember our retired assistant chief goes, well, you should always be nice. There's no reason to never be nice. That's a human trait. All of us should be nice. But we also don't want you to be the hammer. We're not here to play whack-a-mole and hammer the crap out of everybody. The goal of, think about it, the goal of discipline, and this is very eloquently said, the goal of discipline is to change behavior. Some people, you got to drop the hammer on. Some people, even if you fire them, you'll never change their behavior. Some people, all you got to do is just do this. One of our retired battalion chiefs used to do this when he did this to you you knew he was pissed at you and you and i remember god i disappointed dad i mean he was a great battalion chiefs you know but this was his way to try to change behavior but the problem is this didn't work on anybody some people he had to write up some people had to be taken even further but again you got to be the designated adult because again that's why the fire chief's putting you in that position someone's got to be the one that says no stop it knock it off and then number 10, the inability to demonstrate to the Raiders that they can hit the ground running, not just be a safe beginner. Seriously, that's the best way to look at it. Don't just hit the ground running. Or excuse me, don't just be a safe beginner. Every, I mean, that's, we hope everyone's a safe beginner. Be someone that can be a safe beginner, but can also hit the ground running because chances are when that list comes out, meaning the promotional test is over and they establish the hiring list, the eligibility list, 
there's a good chance there may be promotions immediately, like that list comes out on Monday morning, and then Monday afternoon, the fire chief could be calling up number one, hey, Joe Smith, you're getting promoted to captain effective next Friday. Oh, perfect. Number two, Lisa, Lisa Jones, you're getting the second badge. I mean, that's how quick it could be. So, yeah, you better have your act together. That's why it goes back to don't just prepare for the test, prepare for the position, because you could be immediately promoted or acting, and you know what? You don't get a second chance to make a first impression. So just some things to think about. So if you don't go into your next promotional exam having fully prepared for the position, you're not going to do as well as you hope to. So learn from the mistakes of others. Hopefully this information has been beneficial in some capacity, but as always, thank you very much for the gift of your time. I sincerely, sincerely mean that. Feel free to reach out to me if I can ever be of assistance to you. Feel free to connect with me on social media. Like I said, my website, Code 3 Fire Training, has a lot, .com, has a lot of great free information on there, documents, videos, presentations, really to help you be the best it is you want to be. Best firefighter, best captain, best chief, and also help you within the promotional process. So until the next episode, take care, stay safe, and we'll see you soon.